All right, here's the video I've been promising you guys on uh, timing belt replacement on this 2.5 in this 01 Ranger. I finally got the bolt broke loose. Um, here's the bolt right here. That is a 22 millimeter socket. And let me show you what I had to do to get it loose. This is a manual transmission truck. It's a five speed. So I put the transmission in fourth gear, set the parking brake down there. And then I used my other truck, and I backed it up bumper to bumper, just like that. And then I blocked my other truck and put him in first gear. There's his chalk block down there, and his other chalk block back there on that tire. And I pulled the fan and the shroud to gain access down there, and the idea was to warm the truck up, and then try to break it loose that way because my thought was it had Loctite on it, but it didn't. Just your standard bolt. So now that we got that out of there, we're going to put that in our, our coffee cup here, or coffee can that we are using for our bolts. We can go ahead and remove our water pump pulley. We can go ahead and take our cover off of our timing belt so that we can see what happens next. I'm going to attempt to take the belt off without having to take this bracketry loose. But I don't know if I'm going to be very successful with that. So I'm going to tear this down a little bit, bring you back, and show you what I did. Okay, what I've done so far is I've taken out the water pump pulley. I have pulled the upper radiator hose to give you room. You have to take out four bolts. They're 13 millimeter. That loosens your air conditioning compressor. Don't unhook the hoses. And then what I did was I hooked up this bungee cord system to kind of hold it in place. Um, you also have to drain your radiator. So we'll reuse that fluid since it's still good fluid. And then over here on the side, I'm not sure if you can see it or not. Let me see if I can get a light down there. Alright, let me show you what I got going on down here. Alright, you gotta take this bracket off right here. Where my light shines, there's a bolt there that's 13 millimeter. There's a bolt there that's 10 millimeter. Then you go down here, the power steering pump kind of gets in the way. If you notice, right in line with this bolt right here is your hose coming off the uh, power steering pump. Uh, what I did was, that's all 13 millimeters, so I took a wrench, and there's a nut that goes on before that uh, piece of bracket right there, that hold down. So, that nut's right here. I went and broke the nut loose with a wrench, and then I positioned my socket back in there, and I spun it out with the socket. You don't want to try to do it any other way, because if you break that nipple off the bottom of that power steering reservoir, you're done. You have to change out the pump. So, what you doubt, what I'll do next is uh, take my wrench back in there and I'll break that loose. And then there's that 13 millimeter right there. And then this bracketry can come back out. When you get the bracketry out, it will free up the front of this belt cover. This belt cover's got mainly plastic tabs holding it down. There's one bolt down in the bottom that's a 10 millimeter there's a bolt that goes in that hole that's an 8 millimeter I used the 5 sixteenths and then this front cover should come off and then once I get the cover off I'll show you what to do next I got the timing cover off. I got the bolts out. There's your bracketry. Yeah, it's going to look like a mess. And if you're unsure about your abilities as far as uh, radiators concerned, it'd be my advice to remove it because this thing does flop around quite a bit in here. But uh, this is your timing belt right here. And your cam sprocket here. That's your tensioner here. That's your oil pump pulley down there. That runs your oil pump. And then down there's your crank. 
And on this vehicle, it's redesigned from the 89 that I did. On the 89, I had to remove the harmonic balancer because there's a sensor in there, your uh, crankshaft position sensor. This one, they've got the sensor positioned offside over here. So, removing the crankshaft may not need to be done. Uh, may, uh, the harmonic balancer. There's a 10 millimeter bolt here and then there's another 10 millimeter bolt on the other side of the crank that you're going to have to take out because that's a cover. That cover has to come off in order for this belt to pass over the harmonic balancer. So that's what we're going to be doing next. So we're going to remove that cover and swap out this belt. Okay, I'm about to take the belt off. I want to show you a few things. That diamond mark right there on your camshaft has to be straight up. There's an arrow mark down here. Lines up with an arrow mark on the crank camshaft. Down here on your pump, oil pump, there's a corresponding diamond. Those must be straight. To do this, the best way to do it is to take out your number one spark plug on the driver's side. And then you can look down in the hole. You can see your pistons all the way up. That means you're centered and you're in time. Then, to get the belt loose, that's a 17 millimeter. Back it out two complete turns. Inside here on your tensioner is a 13 millimeter bolt. You want to loosen that up. And then take you a small crowbar. Place it down here with this end away from the gear. You do not want it touching the gear. You're just using it as a leverage point. Press up against the tensioner as far in as it'll go. Tighten this bolt back up. Now you can pull your belt off. Just like this. See that? Now your belt's off. Now you just got to go through and put your new belt on. And we'll do that here in just a second. Okay, I've got my timing belt off. One thing you might want to do is that keyway needs to be sitting upward, straight up. One thing I mentioned earlier was the need for leaving the harmonic balancer on. You cannot do this with the harmonic balancer still on. The repair manual doesn't specify, but I am telling you from personal experience that that harmonic balancer must come off in order to do this because otherwise you can't get the belt off the bottom sprocket so now that we've got our keyway straight up we've got our timing marks where they need to be according to specifications by the way that's that bolt I was telling you about earlier that you can use to hold that tensioner in the loose position what we're going to do is when we go to put the belt on we're going to loosen that up. That spring is going to pop back out and it's going to tighten that belt back up. You want to make sure everything's dead on when you do it. If you're off even one tooth, you're going to have performance issues. Another thing, because of having to use the puller, I removed the radiator because there's no other way to do it. So what you want to do is you want to get yourself a puller, hook it up, and I'll show you on the harmonic balancer where the bolts go for the puller. On the harmonic balancer, your puller is going to go in those three bolts right there. And then when you install this, it's going to sit straight up like that. That's going to fit inside of a key that's already inside the crankshaft. When you go to put this back on, do not, under any circumstances, use the center bolt to put that back on. You can use a hammer. You can use a special installation tool. You can use any other means, but do not use the bolt. What will happen is that bolt can break, it can strip, it can cause a whole bunch of problems. That is the reason why when I did my 89 Ranger, I had to change my crank, because I snapped the bolt off halfway into the crankshaft. So do not use the bolt when you tighten that up. If you want, you can put a little bit of lubrication on the inside of the harmonic balancer and then kind of slide it back on. It came off really easy, so you shouldn't have any problems. So we're going to go ahead and get this put back together. And when we get to another point, I'll show you what i got done so far. Let's bring you up to speed on what I've got done so far. I've got this bracket put back on. I've got the air conditioning system reconnected. 
except for this wire right here that I'm going to have to uh, reroute and tape to that plastic, but I can do that later. I've got my fan shroud in place. I'm getting ready to put it up here on the radiator. I've got to loosen the fan blade back up because it's not centered correctly, and I'll show you what's going on here with that. When this thing goes on, it should sit flat. You can see a little bit of the bolt sticking through down there. So, I was in the dark when I was doing this last night, so that's probably why it's like that. So, all I'll do is loosen those d bolts up and then wiggle the fan sh fan till it sits flat against that pulley, and then I'll tighten those bolts back up. Um, I've got to pull the radiator back out because there's a guard that sits on top here that fell down last night and it's trapped down there between that catch pan and the radiator. I've got to pull that back out and then get that position back on top, get the bolts back in here and get this tightened up. Then I can put my fan shroud on and my upper radiator hose. I've got to connect the lower radiator hose and then we'll hook the battery back up, we'll add some coolant to it and get it started. And the next step after that will be what they call burping the cooling system. And I'll show you how to do that when the time comes. So I'm going to get all of this done up. I'll bring you back for the startup. This is the piece I had to retrieve. This is the upper guard. And it fits on there like this. Say like that. This is facing up. One thing you want to keep in mind of when you're doing this is there's a divider right here that divides the AC condenser from the radiator. It kind of allows for a straight flow of air to pass through. That has to be up like this when you put the radiator down. Otherwise, if you have it pushed down, you're going to have contact between the two items and it's not supposed to be that way. You're going to put your radiator down on these feet right here and then your bolts go back in these locks right here these uh, clips and as you can see on the radiator they're adjustable so they're meant to slide so if you can't get one side lined up slide it one way or the other you see it's also got these same pieces on the sides of the condenser this is all protection stuff to protect the radiator and the condenser so I wanted to show you all of that before I put the radiator back in. We've got our upper hose on. We've got our shroud put in place. Went through and fixed the fan pulley. You can see now that it's lined up correctly. When you do that, you want to just loosen all the bolts up. You don't have to take them out. And then opposite bolts like this one and that one over there, you want to just tighten them up first. Because what that's going to do is that's going to walk this back on the water pump pulley or the water pump shaft. And then after you get those tightened up, you can go and tighten up the other ones. So those are 10 millimeter, by the way. Um, all the radiator bolts are 10 millimeter. Fan shrouds, 10 millimeter. Um, the one bolt to hold that bracket on is 10 millimeter. The rest of them are 13s. This down here that holds the cover on, that's a 5 16th but you can use an 8 millimeter if you have one available. So, we're at the point where we're going to use our funnel and our screen that we made in a previous video and we're going to add our antifreeze. Make sure you have your overflow tank hose hooked up. When you put your radiator hoses on, you'll notice that they may have these uh, spring clamps with indentations on the hose. You want to line this up as close to the indentation as possible because that's what they call a sealing point. And if you don't line it up just right, it could leak. Another thing I've done for precautionary reasons because we did pull the radiator and the lower radiator hose was I put my drain pan down there just in case. Um, we'll check for leaks and everything after the system's been burped, as they say. And... If something has to happen, we'll just end up changing that clamp down there, but I don't think we'll need to. So we're going to add our coolant, and then I'll bring you back for the startup. All right, we got our 
battery hooked back up. All of our hoses are hooked up. Fluids in the radiator. Now for the moment of truth. If everything's done correctly, this truck should start. Now it may take a little while for it to start because it's got to locate the tone wheel for the crankshaft position sensor. But once it's located it, it should start right up. Make sure you got your vehicle in neutral. Parking brakes on. Now this is a manual transmission, so of course you have to push your clutch in. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, we have succeeded. This is what we came for. Let the truck run while it's running. This is where we need to do the burping of the uh, cooling system. Check for any leak. Don't see any leak. Lift our. All right, we're going to have to add some antifreeze. Get our bucket. That's manifest good. Make sure as you're adding the antifreeze you get it through the screen. Just set your antifreeze jug right there. Keep an eye on your level. As long as you can see it through the light, then it's high enough to run. You want to make sure you get it up high enough to circulate through the upper radiator hose because that's where you're going to get all of your air from. Because it's going to burp from the top, not the bottom. Hold your fluid. See the air bubble? It's already trying to burp its way through. Let's set our bucket down here. Alright, so what we're going to do now is we're going to squeeze the upper radiator hose. The reason you're doing this is to make sure that we got coolant flow going through the system. Plus what this will do is this will introduce all the air bubbles to the top. That's only part of what you need to do to burp the system. The other part requires loosening the radiator cap several times to take the pressure off the system because you're going to use the pressure in the system to get all the air out. So it's a good idea to have an extra gallon of antifreeze on standby because you're probably going to need it. Even though you would figure that what you pulled from the engine would be enough. I've come across it in many situations where the uh, amount you pull out is not enough. And of course we got our drain pan to catch any overflow. And all that fluid that ends up in that pan, it'll be put back in the container and It'll either go back in the radiator or it'll go in the coolant reservoir tank over there. So now what we'll do is we'll take our radiator funnel out and we'll set it to the side. We'll go ahead and we'll cap it. Let it warm up. And then we will just open, close, open, close with one hand on the upper radiator hose to feel the bubbles. You will feel the bubbles coming through the hose as you do this. You want to do this both with the engine on and then with the engine off. But the reason we got to let it warm up is so that the thermostat will open and allow circulation through the system. So while we're letting that happen, we're going to go back and check our temperature gauge. And our temperature gauge, we're still cold, so it's going to be a minute. So what we're going to do is we're going to run it through, raise the idle up a little bit, 
kind of aid in warming up the engine. While we're at it, we can look at the back side and our tank or our camshaft fully. Make sure we got everything hooked up right while we're running it. Everything looks good on the front side. Just let it idle. We're still cold, so we're going to ahead and just run it up a little bit more, just kind of even it out a little bit. One other thing you might want to do, because you're trying to get all the air out of the system, is add a little bit of coolant to the recovery tank because when this thing starts popping the air out it's going to go through this tube right here and you can hear it bubble up inside the coolant recovery tank so what you can see down in there you can see we got some air bubbles already starting up and the reason you want to put coolant in here is because as it's taking the air out it's replacing it with fluid so the first place it's going to get the fluid from is going to be the recovery tank you see all the bubbles so let's check our temperature gauge see where we're at our temperature gauge still says we're cold so it might take a little bit for this truck to warm up You want to just let it idle because that's where your fluid's going to start to get the most water or the most air out of it. And you can see in there, I don't know if you can see it very well. Let's zoom in a little bit here so you can see. You can start to see a little bit of where the uh, fluid's moving. You want it to, you want to see some movement other than the vibration off the truck. Now while it's doing that, like I was telling you before, you want to go ahead and open this up. And as you're doing that, watch inside there as I do this. Now we just kind of spit a little bit of coolant down along the side of the engine here. So, thermostat's still not open. So we're not going to get too much in the way of any kind of... Well... Yeah, we're not going to get anything in the way of temperature or... Uh, well... Another thing you want to do while you're waiting on your thermostat to open is because we had the air conditioning system pulled off the truck or at least set off to the side and that metal hose being the way it is you want to go ahead and turn on the air conditioning and make sure that it still works any system that you touched whether it be the power steering pump the AC unit cooling system you want to make sure that everything's working because if it's not working you need to find out why and fix it so we got our Control set. We're going to go to AC. Well, I heard the compressor kick and the idle speed on the truck dropped. Max AC, so we'll go ahead and raise the idle up a little bit. Now we're getting some movement on our temperature gauge. I want you to see this. See how that's moving back and forth? That's every time it goes up and comes down, that's air bubbles. See right now it's at its true reading. So what it's going to do is it's going to kick back up and it's going to do this about three or four different times. See now it's starting to go back up. I apologize if this is blurry.
But anytime you've got gauge movement, that is good because that's telling you that the circulation is happening through the cooling system. So our gauge is back to where it was before. So that tells me we need to go out here and we need to check our recovery tank. We need to see where we're at on our recovery tank. Yeah, it looks like we got some junk in our recovery tank. We're going to have to find a way to get that out of there. My advice would be to, because it's on it, oops, see, there's some bubbles. There's some bubbles happening. See? That's what you want. You want the bubbles to happen. Every time it bubbles like that, your temperature gauge is moving. It's doing that to indicate that there's air in the system and every time it goes up there's an air pocket. You want to run the truck until all the air bubbles are out. It may take as long as 15 to 20 minutes keeping an eye on this fluid level because as it brings air out it's putting fluid back in so it's going to draw from this tank back through this hose. But as I was saying earlier about the stuff in the coolant, what you can do is since it's on a hose, unhook the hose and let it dump into the uh, drain bucket and then add new coolant to it, which I think we'll, that's what we might do here in just a second. So we're going to check our gauge and then we're going to shut the truck off. And then we're going to open up the, thir the radiator cap and let it bubble some more. Alright, so now we're going to shut our truck off. We're going to come out here and we're going to take the pressure off the cap and we're going to listen to the bubbles. Hear them? See that? That's all air in your system. All that air is in your system. See that? All right, then we're going to slowly lift our cap up because we are warmed up now. The truck is warm. Yeah, see, we need to add coolant. So before we do that, though, we're going to unhook this hose and we're going to let the coolant drain down into our bucket. We're going to empty this coolant tank out to get as much of that crap out of there as we can because what we're going to do is we're going to put this in our container and we're going to put it back in the coolant system with the screen so if this junk comes out we're not going to reintroduce it back into the system we're just going to go ahead and run it through the screen but this in a nutshell is how you would go about getting your cooling system done you want to make sure to check your fluid level as you do this and I think that'll do it for right now I'll be back in just a minute with a recap of everything and that'll wrap it up for this project. Alright, let's do a recap of everything. Starting from the crankshaft bolt that we couldn't get loose the first few times. What you want to do in that situation, if you have a manual transmission, is do like I did. I took my one truck and bumped it up to the other truck. I put this truck in first gear and I chalked the wheels, as you've seen in the beginning of the video. If you don't have another vehicle you can do this with, by the way, a word of caution when doing this, don't use a vehicle that has airbag sensors in the bumpers or that has plastic bumper covers must be metal bumpers and frame vehicles only for this to work otherwise you're going to create a lot of problems if you don't have a vehicle that meets those requirements but you do have a solid building such as a brick garage or a brick house or something of that nature like I do that would have been my next step I would have backed the truck up against the house and used the house as a leverage point you're not going to damage the house trust me or if you were using your garage you're not going to damage the garage so as long as it's not a wood frame and it's a concrete structure you'll be fine if neither one of those work if you've got trees like I do 
back it up to a tree. Whatever you have to do to keep the vehicle from moving to where you can break that bolt loose. Another thing too, before you break that bolt loose, make sure you put the vehicle in fourth gear because that's your one-to-one -one gear on this truck. If you have a different setup, you want to go online and find your gear ratios and look for the gear that's one-to-one. -one. You want that because that's direct drive. If you put it in overdrive, it's not going to work very well. If you put it in first gear, it's not going to work at all. I've learned that as well. So once you get the bolt loose, you want to make sure you have a pulley puller for the harmonic balancer pulley. Regardless of what the manual says, the manual doesn't mention anything about pulling the pulley. You have to do it. There's no way around it. You can't get the belt off without pulling the harmonic balancer pulley. There's just no other way around it. There is a guard that goes along the bottom, but that guard is kept in place by two bolts and it goes inside the harmonic balancer pulley. So either way, it's got to come off. So make sure you've got a pulley puller for that. Another tool you want to have on hand is a set of ratchet wrenches. You're going to need those. I was thankful enough that I had my ratchet wrenches because otherwise I'd still be working on those bolts down there. Especially the one that sits behind the power steering pump. Because the way that bolt's set up, it's set up directly in line with your return hose for your power steering pump. And unless you want to go and have to bleed out your power steering pump and everything like that just for that bolt, just to get a socket in there, I would just as soon rather have a long handled 13 millimeter wrench, ratchet wrench, and just stick it inside that little slot right there and just work it back and forth until the bolt came out. So, a little bit there for you. Um, another thing too, when you go to take this off, lift it up straight ahead and set it up here. I used bungee cords and I bungee cord one end to the receiver dryer and the other end to the radiator strut mount just to give it some place to hang on to and it works really well otherwise this thing tends to go forward and it'll land right into your radiator or your condenser or whatever you have up in the front and if it hits it hard enough and damages those fins it's a bad day for everyone so we've got that done and then just make sure when you burp it that you're doing it like I showed you where you open this up and then you close it eventually what will happen is after your fluid levels up all the way here your coolant tank over here will start to see bubbles one other thing too is if you have any kind of uh, dirt or anything in there it's a good idea while you've got the cooling system tore down to clean that out because that dirt will find its way into your engine and it'll clog up a thermostat or stop up a fin on a water pump real easy you'd be surprised what a leaf would do so make sure you do that other than that we're ready to go another thing you want to do since you're checking your AC is turn your thermostat or your heater control on and check your heater and you'll notice as you raise the idle you should get heat if you don't get heat, there's still an air bubble stuck in there. Just keep working it till you get it all out. It will come out. So other than that, um, if you have to use a vehicle like I did here to unlock those two vehicles from where they're at, all I'm going to do is remove my bricks from the front of my wheels on this truck, roll it forward to take the pressure off that truck, and then I'll just move that truck and we'll be done. So, if you have any questions or anything, one last thing before I go. Make sure, and this is critical, you write the mileage down of when this was done. Because this job has to be done again at 60,000 miles. If you check the belt, and you can check the belt just by pulling this cover forward, and it's got cracks and splits in it like the old belt does. And I've got the old belt right here, and I'll show it to you. If it looks anything like this belt did, you see how that belt's got a bunch of cracks and splits in it? If it looks anything like that, even though the underside, the underside looks really good. 
This is dry rotted real bad. As I was taking it off the truck, I heard it cracking. That's a bad day. If you got this situation, when you go to check that at 60,000 miles, change it again. Guaranteed every 120,000, change it mandatory. But if you change it at 60,000, it's more or less preventative maintenance. This is the original belt that came on the truck from Ford. And as you've seen on the odometer, the truck had 173,000 miles. I probably could have gone about 220,000 on this belt. But the fact that I do a lot of towing of heavy stuff and I do a lot of stop and go traffic, I probably, just when you least expect it, would break. And so this is more or less a mandatory replacement. But uh, anyway, I'm going to wrap it up here. We got our truck done. And if you have any questions, go ahead and comment. And we'll talk to you next time.